Oh, man. My desk right now, it is just a total cluster. Hey, you know what? Shout out to Athletic Brewing, my favorite non-alcoholic beer out there. Not a paid plug. I'm a brand ambassador, and I want to just celebrate what they do at Athletic Brewing. Athleticbrewing.com. If you go there, you can use the promo code BRENDANO20 at checkout and get a nice little discount on your first order. I don't get any money, and they are not an official sponsor of the podcast. I just want that to be clear. I just get points for swag and beer. Give it a shot. Try the Athletic Light or the Free Wave. My personal favorites right now, especially the Free Wave. It's uh, it's the best. It's, my, it's been my favorite for a long time, and I'm so glad it's uh, it's around. Check it out. Oh, dude, try knocking on a door. You kidding me? Uh, I, I was a news reporter. We we weren't picking up phones. You know, we were stalking up to front steps and pounding on a door. So, you want to talk about cold call anxiety? Oh, hey, CNFers! It's CNF Pod. You know that creative nonfiction podcast, a show where I speak to badass people about telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. Whoopee! Who's on the podcast this week, Lachlan? That's right, Lachlan's here. Oh, what What was that? Christopher McDougal, author of Born to Run, The Underrated Natural Born Heroes, Running with Sherman, and now The Guidebook, Born to Run 2, The Ultimate Training Guide, published by Knopf. It's a beautiful book. High quality photos, full color, super inclusive and representative, with tips on running drills, food, footwear, and wonderful profiles of all kinds of people that illustrate that running isn't the purview of just one demographic. You know, I'm told in Christopher's signature voice, there's just, it's just pulsing with energy and joy. And it's just a, it's a rip-roaring good read and uh, tactical, naturally. And wouldn't you know that Christopher and his co-conspirator on this book, the running coach Eric Orton, have partnered with Zero, that's Zero with an X, Zero Shoes, for a born-to-run branded minimal running shoe. And uh, this, I, I just happen to have a pair of Zero Prios, which I really, really love uh, for, for lifting, but also that's what I use for running. I run on softer surfaces. They are that minimal where it's practically barefoot. And I, I, I do like it. I find them really comfortable. Um, not a paid plug. I just so I was like, when I saw that they were partnering, I'm like, wow, I like Christopher McDougal. I like Zero Shoes. They're both doing something together. Holy shit. I might just have to buy a pair for my unsanctioned McKenzie Marathon, scheduled for August 5th, along the McKenzie River Trail east of Eugene. I hope to get fit and, more importantly, stay healthy. I'm in week four of my very basic training plan. Anyway, if you find yourself in Eugene in early August, maybe I'll see you at the trailhead. Growler of beer and a handshake to the winner. Winner will set a world record. Well, if that doesn't sell you. Make sure you're headed over to brendanomero.com hey, hey, for show notes and to sign up for the Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter. It's on Substack now, so just click the lightning bolt on my website or visit rageagainstthealgorithm.substack.com. Still first of the month, no spam can't beat it. I was thinking about calling it This American Life, but alas, you can't keep changing names on people. You just can't. So we rage. If you dig the show, consider sharing it with your networks so we can grow the pie and get this CNF and thing into the brains of other CNFers who need the juice. You can also leave a kind review on Apple Podcasts. So the wayward CNFer might say, well, shit, I'll give that a shot. And, you know, for the... For the for the people who just have some spare chains jiggling around in their pockets, maybe even in your couch, if anyone even carries change in cash anymore, patreon.com slash cnfpod. You could drop a few bucks in the hat if you glean some value from what we churn and burn here at CNF Pod HQ. Would you like office hours over at Patreon? Like maybe a once a month thing? I'm thinking maybe like... Maybe like the happy hour or maybe just office hours where and uh, we can talk about maybe a uh, book marketing platform, reporting, research, writing. I don't know. We could try that. Maybe next month I'll do it. You CNF and patrons deserve it. Show is free still, but it sure as hell ain't cheap. OK, you know what? Are you ready? Are ready? There's enough housekeeping. I know my housekeeping is repetitive, but that's the nature of it. It's like driving by a billboard. 
every time you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to read it. I don't even want to read it. Now all of a sudden it's all wow. I suddenly need some tires. All right, let's hear from Christopher McDougal about writing, running, cold calls, and giving yourself credit when you pull off a great bit of writing. You know, we're, we're so prone to beating the living shit out of ourselves, and it's nice to give ourselves credit every now and again. Okay, let's do the CNFers. Riff. I know. And I got to say, you know, a few emails back when I was asking you, like, you know, what you might like to read in a Prefontaine biography. And you're like, you know what? Just follow the story and write the best story possible, essentially, is what paraphrasing. And I just want to say, like, that was just uh, that that meant a lot. That was like a really, really sound counsel, you know, just to follow the story, follow the research, follow the reporting and then just like write the best story possible. I was like, oh, that's you know, that really makes sense. I really need to hear that. You know, it's funny. It's those little things that are so instrumental, but, you know, I've been having conversations, uh, you know, we have born to run two out. And so it brings up the question of like, what happened with born to run? Like, why did that book take hold? And, and um, people ask me that question a lot. And to me, the answer really harkens back to a bit of advice I got from an editor friend of mine. And I don't listen to editors, man. You know, like I have no time <laughs> for editors. I'm the, the worst person to have on the other side of the desk if you're an editor. But my buddy, Bill Gifford, who back then was an editor at Philadelphia Magazine and, and neighbor of mine in, in North Philly. When I started working on this, he, uh, he said, hey, just remember, man, tell the story from the beginning. Like, don't tell it from the end. Mm. Tell it from where you were when you didn't know anything. And that stuck with me. Like that, to me, was the make or break bit of advice. Tell it from the beginning. Because, you know, after two years of research, you're going to know everything about pre. And you're going to forget what you didn't know back in the day. And so you need to remind yourself of just what it was like at this moment when you were just coming to grips with his personality and his style and his character. And that's what you want to convey to the reader. And that, so for me, that was instrumental. I think Born to Run was a book that people liked because I think they felt they were in my shoes on, on the journey. Yeah. And when you're, when you, in some of the books you you've written and you know, you're doing your researching and your reporting, and this is something I'm somewhat struggling with too. It's like, sometimes you talk to people and you get like a really cool nugget, a really cool anecdote and it, it's illustrative of someone's character, but it's, it, you start to think like, how do I string this along? So there is like a narrative there. So the story is there and it's not just like a cool little factoid or a cool little, like he, st he stood up to a bully here. It's just like, that's really cool. But how do you str you know, start to stretch it out? So it actually feels like a story. Is that something that, that you've encountered and struggled with? Yeah, I'll give you a good one. So Emil Zabopek was this superstar track runner of the 1940s and 50s. Uh, he was a Czechoslovakian soldier who came out of World War II. And during World War II, he used to train by running in place on guard duty. So he'd be standing in like knee-deep snow somewhere in Eastern Europe on guard duty at night. And just to keep himself warm, he used to run in place. And little things like that taught him really uh, great running form and resilience and self-reliance, et cetera. So when I was writing Born to Run, I knew that one guy I was writing about who was already a secondary, maybe even a tertiary character, but he really admired Emil Zadopek. And I knew Emil Zadopek had this amazing backstory. And I'm thinking about this like, man, that is a pretty thin hook <laughs> to hang all this stuff on. <laughs> Particularly when at the point in the story when I was writing about it, I was already about six digressions away from the narrative, you know? So when I was, the main story takes place in the Copper Canyon in 2005 when me and a group of runners went down for this race against the Tarahumara. Uh, and then I, I went into a backstory in the 1990s when this guy named Micah True saw the Tarahumara in Leadville. Then I went back a year earlier to when the Tarahumara first showed up before Mike was even involved. And there was a guy, a coach from Adams State College in Arizona, who went to watch them. So this is where I'm at. So I'm already 
six beats away from what's actually the book is about. And now I had this other guy, Emil Zadopek, who was a runner in the 1950s. And so this is like six degrees of separation, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to tell that story. And I kept kind of circling it. And here's what I figured in the end. Nobody cares as long as it's a good story. You know, we, we, we beat ourselves up. And this was particularly a problem or a situation back when I was a magazine writer. Because, you know, when I worked for like Runner's World or Men's Health or um, particularly Philadelphia Magazine, you come up with a story idea and they're like, well, what's the hook? Like, why now? Why the news hook? And I would just say, who cares? People don't care. You know, you don't have to like situate it on this date. If it's a good story, people don't care. And so I think if I were you, I would uh, take the nugget and keep it in an open file and then go one of two ways. You know, either you find out more about the nugget where the nugget actually expands and grows, you know, and, and so with the Meals Adipec thing, this ended up becoming its own standalone digression. I think I, you know, I probably gave Zadipec like five pages yeah. when I was really only thinking about a paragraph. And, I, and when I said into my editor, I was like kind of bracing myself. Like the first thing he's going to say is, are you kidding me? Well, why are we in 1950s Czechoslovakia? Uh, and they, they left it. Now looking back, a lot of people uh, really enjoy that passage of the book. And, and so do I. So I think the idea is that if it's good, if it lives and breathes, um, let it let it walk the earth. And you, again, you can go one of two ways with it. You can either hook it on something where it is a momentary digression and it's not going to interrupt your flow, or you may end up blowing it out and making it longer. And that's fine because nobody nobody's going to be distracted. No one's going to get lost in your story as long as that one is worth their time. Mm, yeah, that's really that's really good counsel for regarding that for for sure. And uh. I, I in, in your in your book writing and your reporting, even going back to your magazine days, uh, do you did you ever run into a, a certain measure of anxiety around uh, cold calling sources and in, in, in the phone? It's something I struggle with. I work. I have to just work through it. It's just what you have to do. But it does give me like <laughs> tightness of the chest. And I wonder if for you, if you ever express that degree of a, or at least have that kind of. Uh, trepidation around cold calling and how you, how you might work through it. Uh, dude, try knocking on a door. Are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> right. I, I was a news reporter. We we weren't picking up phones. You know, we were stalking up to front steps and pounding on a door. So, you want know, to talk about cold call anxiety? <laughs> you know who I learned from? Here's a writer that you may want to talk to sometime. Uh, Nikki Wisensy Egan. So she is the pointy tip of the spear with all of the Bill Cosby reporting. Oh, wow. She was writing for the Philadelphia Daily News and then went on to People Magazine and went on to write a book about Cosby. So, uh, but she got her, she made her bones working for the Philadelphia Daily News, which back in the day was one of the, say, five grittiest newspapers in the country. This is, you know, OG, old style, shoe leather reporting. And I learned a lesson from her because I was working for the Associated Press in Philly back then. I, I consider myself, you know, a pretty armor plated news reporter because I, I had begun working for the AP overseas uh, in Portugal and Africa. And so there's a lot of conflict reporting uh, and, and a lot of, you know, you had, you had to pivot really fast. You know, you're doing a news story one hour and then suddenly the prime minister calls a press conference because they're devaluing the currency and you got to charge off and confront like a minister of economics, you know, mm -hmm. so you couldn't pussyfoot around. You had to get right to the person with the answers and ask them. But even I was a kid compared to Nikki Wisensee. And there was a case in a place called the Badlands, North Philly. And I forget what happened. Some kind of a shooting might have been a cop killing. And a bunch of reporters were there. So there's the Philadelphia Inquirer and there might have been a New York Times Stringer and the AP and Daily News. In the conversation, someone said, hey, I, th I think I heard that like the grandmother lives nearby. And Nikki instantly pivots on her heel, walks up to the nearest door and bangs on it. And then bangs on the next one, bangs on the next one. And I was watching her going, holy shit. You know what? I'm I'm in school. You're in school, son. Uh, and that's what she did. So I learned from Nikki, Nikki uh, Wisensee. And now you see the Bill Cosby reporting. And it's no surprise that early on when everybody else was like, well, you know, could he America's dad? And Nikki Wise he's like, man, this is what the facts say. So uh, I, I would say a couple things. One is for you uh, take talk to Nikki. She's um, 
she is a throwback for a relatively young person. She's a throwback to a different era. But here's the thing. All those requests go one of two ways. Don't want to talk to you. Why are you bothering me? So be it. Or number two, I really want to talk. And most times it's that one. Right. You know, people, people love to talk. And almost every time you'll call somebody up and in the course of telling you they don't want to talk, they'll just start talking. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, speaking of good reporting and, you know, the, the, you know, Born to Run one is, you know, it's a one, wonderful book that just it uh, and and now you've got the, the Born to Run two come out, which is which is such a great uh, a great field guide. And I imagine there might have been moments where you're like, all right, you had the first book and now this one you're like, oh, this one might be something of a, like a training log. But this I think it, it, this mutated into something that was so great, like so many great profiles and such a good holistic approach to making, you know, running inclusive and fun. So, yeah, how did the, how did this uh, manifest itself after, you know, I don't know, 12 or 13 years after the original book came out? I really enjoyed this process a lot. And it's something that I never thought I was going to do. I never saw myself doing a sequel. And I heard it all the time. You know, you should do a follow-up. You should do a follow-up. Yeah, what's the point? To me, when the curtain drops, that's over, man. Like that was the story. And it's not like part two. And so I, I never had any interest in another Born to Run. In fact, the book after Born to Run was about as radical departure as you could come up with. You know, it was Natural Born Heroes where I was in World War II Crete looking at resistance fighters. Uh, but what happened with Born to Run 2 were two things. One was when I was conceiving of and, and writing Born to Run, I assumed, A, either no one's really going to pay attention because there were no popular running books out there. There was one, uh, Ultra Marathon Man, which was a really great ripping yarn. You know, Dean Carnez, I thought, did a terrific job with his story, but it really only appealed to kind of a small audience at the time. Even though he was a really popular figure, he was getting on Letterman and on TV a lot. But at the same time, he was just seen as kind of this uh, one-off oddball. And and what he did really didn't apply to most people. That was kind of the, the mainstream perception. So, and again, running books didn't sell. There was almost nothing on the shelf other than, you know, how-to manuals about how not to get shaved or how to train for your fastest 5K, something like that. So I assume, okay, well, you know, Born to Run's going to drop. And if I'm lucky, it'll have a, you know, a, little, a little flash of popularity and then it's going to be gone. But, you know, the, the second aspect of it was I felt that I had said everything I had to say, like everything I understood was all packed into this book. It's already chock full of digressions. Uh, just take a bow and exit the stage. But what happened in the subsequent years was that, you know, my assumption that <clears throat> this book would, would either disappear or be blown away by other books that if it were unpopular, then it would be forgotten. And if it was popular, then there'd be just a, uh, blitz of other books blown it out of the water, you know, and other adventure running books that would just take its place and, and Born to Run would be forgotten. But, you know, what I found over the years was kind of a surprise, which is that, yeah, running books um, became popular, but not something like Born to Run. So I keep seeing the same book written over and over again about running, which is about how miserable it is uh and you know the, the race is tough but the runner was tougher and they saw themselves through to the finish line it's basically <clears throat> running keeps being depicted as this like shitty thing you gotta do in order to go on to something better you know mm. like running in, in mainstream media is exactly the way it looks in like all the rocky movies you know rocky doesn't enjoy going for a run he doesn't really have a good time running up the art museum stairs he's just doing it because he's going to get his ass kicked by apollo creed in six weeks so it's the thing you got to do and so all the running books that came out it kind of depicted the same way uh it's a miserable thing but you endured and it's a, it's a test of your grit and to me it's, it's not that at all it's actually something really fun and joyful and communal and this is to me was was the, the key word and universal you know every time you look through either running magazines or Lululemon ads, it's all a bunch of blonde ponytails. But, you know, when I go for a group run, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing all kinds of other people. Yeah. And you never see them depicted. So I got this idea for a Born to Run 2 to accomplish, I thought, three goals. Number one is 
to bring that joy back into it. They remind people, no, man, this is not about making your toenails fall off and your kidney bleed. It's about <laughs> having fun and feeling your body wake up. Uh, number two, it's about the fact that all these faces that you see in real life are what runners are. You know, not, not you know, skinny blondes in compression shorts, but normal people that look like all the rest of us and people of all races and genders and body types. And the last thing was this notion that, you know, just grind it out, just put on the thick shoes and do it is wrong. You know, running is a skill. It's a craft. It's an art like every other physical exercise, you know, like, like swimming or, or tennis or karate or ballet. You know, it's, it's a fine physical skill that you get rewards from if you practice it and master it. So that's why I thought I would dive in, do another one. And I, I thought of it not like a sequel, but more like a, like a mid-quell. It's like all the stuff that I would have said. In Born to Run, if I actually knew it back then, but it took me 15 years to pick up a lot of this stuff that I, I didn't know before. Yeah, and th to the point of you like bringing the fun back into it, like if you look at all the high res color photography in the book, like almost everyone, especially you, you're smiling and laughing, and you're even to the the drills and the you know you're bringing in B52s, Rock Lobster, and the right 90 beat, well 180 beats per minute. I go like 90 beats per per foot strike, and it it brings a levity and it makes this thing that has historically been a slog and something that was done for punishment, and it makes it fun. It makes it the point. Well, there there are two things at work. One was, you know, Eric Gordon, the guy who made all these books possible. He's the guy that I met in Colorado almost 20 years ago now. And when I had this proposition, I said, hey, I, I really want to get down to the Copper Canyon and, invo and get involved in this 50-mile race with the Tarahumata, but I can't. And he goes, dude, you get me into the race, I'll train you for it. So this is a guy that has been my go-to. You know, He's been my Yoda ever since. And But he also knows my attention span is very limited. That if he gives me a bunch of drills, I'm just not going to do them. And if it's something mm -hmm. that's unpleasant, it's not going to happen. So he learned pretty early on. He's got to meet me where I'm at. He's got to come up with something that I'm actually going to do. There's no point in giving me five exercises if I just hate them, don't do them. And so his, his approach is to make it fun, make it playful, make it intuitive. Like you don't have to really think about it. You don't have to watch a bunch of YouTube videos. And so the thing about it is they're fun, they're playful, and you start to feel results really quickly. So I'll give you an example. Like one of his exercises is real simple. He goes, just balance on one foot wherever you are. If you're waiting in line at the post office, just uh, get up on the ball of one foot and lift the other foot off the ground and just see how long you can balance. And I do it now all the time. I now do it kind of obsessively that mm -hmm. if I am not actually in the process of moving forward, if I'm stationary for a second, I, I get up and balance on one foot. And it's this constant game. It's like my uh, like my Rubik's Cube. It's like my fidget toy <laughs> is balancing on one foot. So things like that, but they have enormous consequences. And think about like a drill like that is, you don't need instructions. You don't need any equipment. You can do it anywhere, anytime. And you feel yourself getting better very quickly. The first time you do it, you balance for two seconds, second time, six seconds, you know? So um, it's not like you got to wait a month to see whether you, your bicep has grown by a quarter inch. You're going to start picking up seconds quickly. And at the same time, that tiny little exercise has such ripple effect. Because not only are you strengthening your arch and your foot, but you're also tightening up your core. You're working on your balance. You're improving your posture. Like you, what you learn pretty quickly is, oh, you can't pull this off unless you pull about six or seven other body functions in the line. So th those are the kind of things I think you don't see talked about ever in any kind of sport, really. Uh, rarely do you have people focusing on those little micro movements. But to me, they have a huge impact. Yeah, and I think anyone who uh, takes on the um, the techniques and the skills of of running with a, a, a shorter stride, you you start to feel even if you're kind of kind of a heavy. I'm, I'm I'm built like SpongeBob, you know. I'm like top heavy, <laughs> keg of a torso, and you know. And it's like when I run in my my zero prio shoes and on ideally softer surfaces, just because I'm a heavy kind of a heavier guy. But you start to feel the bounce coming back in your steps. It doesn't feel as clod hopping. You're like you actually feel a bit of spring, and it's like kind of a kind of it's just energizing and kind of 
it's kind of fun to feel that sort of energy coming coming out of you, that bounce. You know, I think if anybody wants to have this argument about running form, it's funny. I hope we're not going too much into the weeds for people who are not runners. But, you know, if you want to tie this back to, you know, Prefontaine and the way his image has been abused, you know, what, what Nike did in the 70s and 80s when they started to push running shoes was, to me, a, a, a master market manipulation, which we're feeling the repercussions of ever since. What they basically told people is, don't worry about form anymore. Just buy this product. And again, you see this in a lot of things too. All these infomercials now. Like, hey, just buy this product. Buy the Thigh Master. You know, buy the the Correct Toes. Buy this. Buy this. Buy this. There's always some device out there that's going to be a shortcut to mastering a skill. But you know, if you're if you're a, a diver, you know, coming off the ten meter board, no one's telling you, oh yeah, put on this wings suit. No, learn how to control your body, and you will get the result you want. And everything too, you know, tennis and swimming, all of it, master your body. Only in running do they tell you, you know what, do whatever the hell you want. Just spend $150 on a pair of shoes, put a carbon fiber plate, put in foam, put in motion control, buy this crap for your feet. And if you want to like end that argument to me once and for all, pull up a YouTube video of like Sonny Liston. Now, Sonny Liston was like a 300 pound boxer you know he was the guy that they called him the bear he was a guy that muhammad ali looked small compared to sunny liston watch sunny liston jumping rope in time to the song night train and it's mesmerizing allow me to jump in for just a moment and to christopher's insight there watching sunny liston this gigantic boxer hundreds of pounds like watching him jump rope is truly mesmerizing. I stopped mid edit right here to go to YouTube to watch it, to which I will link it up. It is incredible. It's uh it's it's like dance. It's pretty spectacular. Because here is this cinder block of a human who's moving so lightly, just pop, 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 pop. And what he's demonstrating to me is perfect running form. Mm. He's using all that elastic recoil of his body to just bounce. And that's what we tell people is that you can bounce. Running doesn't have to be this muscular, painful process. Be light and free and easy. So, yeah, you should check it out sometimes. Sunny Liston, skipping rope to night train. It looks like you do it for like 36 hours without missing a beat. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Because when uh, guys who can jump rope, uh, it almost looks like like ballet in a way. It's 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 really pretty to watch. It's uh um, but, uh, yeah, the w- running is so integral to your, to your life. In, in what way does, does running maybe help inform your writing, uh, as a, as a practice and maybe as a meditative practice where you can flush out, flush out ideas? You know, I never saw it going that route at all. Uh, it, it was kind of a surprise because, at the time I wrote Born to Run, I was, I was not a runner. It was not something that was part of my life. And I approached it like any other assignment that I had. Uh, matter of fact, I actually had another assignment. I was supposed to be researching an article for the New York Times Magazine about Gloria Trevi, this um, fugitive Mexican pop star, when I first heard about the Tarahumara. And that's what led me down to the Copper Canyon in the first place. I was basically trying to double dip. You know, the Times was paying my expenses to go to Mexico and you know, research and interview members of this uh, fugitive pop star sex cult. And while I'm down there, I hear about this tribe. I thought, okay, well, I just peel off for a week, go check this tribe out. And I thought it was gonna be quick and easy, one and done. Get down, interview the tribe, come back, quirky little story for Runner's World. I get uh, two articles, and all the expenses are already covered by by the Times. I don't have to try and sell it to Runner's World. I'm already here. But instead, it just kind of led me down into this tunnel of exploration where I started to ask myself more and more questions and hear more and more stories. And when I broke away and decided, hey, this is actually more than a magazine story. This this could be a really interesting book. And the issues that it brought up to me were still unresolved. Uh, and it basically came down to this. I, I think the light bulb moment when I was working on Born to Run was this realization that, wait a minute, you know, humans are not fragile creatures that need to be sheltered and protected. We're actually unbelievably robust. Mm. Like there's a reason why 
we have populated this planet everywhere. You know, you, you can't turn around without bumping into a human mammal. And that's rare. Like there's no other species that travels and endures and adapts the way humans have. We've even left the planet. You know, we're, trying, we're now branching off to other planets. We're uncontainable. And the reason why is because we are unbelievably robust and adaptable. We can survive on any kind of food in any kind of climate. And that, to me, again, was, was a real eye-opener because, I don't know, I, I guess I had kind of grown up with the notion that, you know, you need certain things. You know, you need heat. You need a car. You need a technology. You need to have certain foods. And, and, and most, to this day, you know, I think that the perception of human wellness, you know, which has become, you know, its own industry, it's all about what you need to have. You know, when is possible, well, you got to eat this and you got to wear that and you have to get this many hours of sleep and you have to have these cold plunges and you have to do this. And I'm down the copper can and realize, hell no, you don't need any of this shit. Hmm. You know, hmm. uh, if you ever, you ever watched the show Naked and Afraid? I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Dude, there's a whole world of really cool uh, endurance programs out there. Or, or an even better one, I think, is, is the show called Alone. Uh, <laughs> you ever seen Alone? Her, again, heard of it, haven't seen it. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm, I am going to destroy your whole reporting calendar. I'm going to send you off <laughs> into a world of people watching. So alone, they take a group, it's like 12 jabonis, and they drop them up in like British Columbia in this horrible, cold, really difficult landscape. And each person is dropped off in an isolated location by themselves. So it's not like they're conspiring. Like, and they don't know where anybody else is. So as far as you know, you're the only one in this patch of British Columbia. And your job is to just survive longer than the other 11. So you're up here in British Columbia, dropped off, and you get 10 items that you can pick yourself. So you can bring like a fishing net, you can bring a fire starter, you can bring like a blanket. But your choice of the 10 items, you can bring a fire starter or not bring a fire starter. A knife, a hatchet, that kind of thing. So... And you're out there, you don't know how long. You might be out there for a month. You might be out there for six years. You're out there until the other 11 drop out and you have no contact with them. So you don't know how long it's going to be. So you got to make shelter, find food, find fresh water, uh, reinforce your clothing. But when I look at this, to me, like that is the story of humanity that we never see in the world around us, which is that when it comes to being a raw animal out in the forest, Humans are like formidable. We're, we're, we are pretty tough, man. We're, we're as ferocious as a grizzly bear. And so that that's became, in a way, weirdly, um, the the uh, the, the silver mine that I was just going to keep excavating, I think, for the rest of my life. That I keep finding these cool stories of how wonderfully creative and adaptable humans are. And I, I just really enjoy checking them out and, and writing about it. So... Here's an example from Born to Run 2. Happened by accident. I never intended this to be a story. But when we were doing the photo shoot, I really wanted to make sure that we had an adaptive athlete represented. I wanted to show people with prosthetics. So a friend of a friend of a friend was this guy named Zach Friedlia. I'd never met Zach. Zach shows up and Zach's a trip. He's just a cool guy. Uh, I've been born without one of his legs and, and several of his fingers. And uh, he... I start to hear his story and hang out with him and see how people respond to him. Everybody loves Zach. Zach loves everybody. And then he started a, a race called Born to Adapt, where he gets a bunch of adaptive athletes to show up on this ranch in Los Olivos, California, and do whatever they can do. You know, just run as much as you can. And so I look at this and like, here is Zach thriving on the planet. And I just felt like, man, this is a story that needs to go into Born to Run 2, that all the people out there who might have suffered a catastrophic accident or born other, other, with other physical capabilities need to know that Zach is out there just bouncing along, running 50-mile races in the mountains on a prosthetic. And so I, I, I hear stories like that. I feel like, man, I could spend the rest of my career meeting these people, learning about them and sharing those stories. Yeah. There's a photo of him in the book where he, he's like taking flight. His hair's blowing back. He's like, he's airborne. Like it's, it's such an, uh, an incredible photo that says so much 
uh, about his spirit and uh, as a as a person and as an athlete. <laughs> you know, what I love most though. Um, there's another picture. I, I I hope it's in the book. I gotta go back and check. If it's not, I'm gonna feel bad the rest of the day. There was a moment when Jenna Crawford, who is this incredibly fit, super strong uh, road racer. You know, she, she wins half marathons. Uh, Jenna is fixing Zach's ponytail and Karma Park, who's a transgender runner, is like next in line. And th- their faces, so Jenna is absorbed. Uh, Zach is patiently waiting for his hair to be styled. And Karma like can't wait to be next. And to me, like that... It's almost a cover picture to me because no one will understand it. But to me, it tells the whole story. These are three people that otherwise in life would never meet each other, but they're bonded by this moment and, and just having a great time together. I, I, just, I just love that picture. You know, Zach, Jenna and Karma united by this activity are all like brothers and sisters together. Yeah. And, and speaking of someone who was something of a, of a, honorific presence in the book of is the Caballo Blanco, Micah True. Uh, he passed away a few years ago in the, in the Copper Canyons, uh, you know, doing, you know, typically what he does, which is just running, uh, forever and ever. And, you know, he, uh, he, uh, you, you write, you write about him and, and, uh, his, his presence and his sort of his spirit. And he strikes me as someone who was, uh, very much with you as you were writing, certainly the first book when he was alive, but especially this one that he had passed. So like, in what way was he kind of with you and embodies the whole spirit of running free, running wild that uh, this book embodies? You know, it's, it's the fundamental question of everything you write is whose story is this? Who am I really writing about? And it, it's a harder question, I think, than most of us realize. So when I originally wrote Born to Run, you know, I had reported it out. I had written a really substantial proposal outline, had it vetted by publishers and, you know, signed on with Kanaf. And then I sat down to write it. By that point, I was kind of bored because I now I've been living with the story for you know more than a year. I'm like, ah, let me do something else. So I tried to tell the story from a different perspective. I was, I was more entertained by Jen Shelton and Billy Barnett. You know, they're like the young Virginia surfers who are drinking their faces off and they get lost in the Canyon. It was just kind of, you know, one animal house adventure after the other with those two. (laughs) And I tried to write the book from their perspective and it just didn't work. And I actually turned in a full draft to my editor on deadline. And he just kind of read it and he called me a few days later. And he's like, you know, I think you should really just start over. You know, he goes, have you even, looked at your proposal because you were good to go and you completely veered from it. And I knew he was right. I, I knew I just, I just screwed up. So I had to ask myself, wait a minute, whose story am I telling here? It's not really mine. It's not theirs for sure. It's really Caballo's story. It's Micah True's story. He's the guy that had the idea. He's the guy that created the race. He's the guy that is most invested. Uh, this is his story. So that was born to run. And here's what's funny When Eric and I sat down to work on Born to Run 2, Micah was not on my mind at all. Mm. Uh, What was on my mind were all the messages that Eric and I have both received over the years from people who are trying to go on the same journey we went on. You know, they want to learn running form. They want to understand how to stop, like, battling calories. They want to understand why running doesn't feel fun for them. You know, all, all the things that Eric was able to teach me and incorporate into my life, they wanted to learn it as well. And, you know, you don't get that from Born to Run. Born to Run, I, I do it, but I don't like to tell you how because I, I didn't really know. You know, I was just doing what Eric told me. I didn't understand his method and and the deep roots it had. So that was the goal of Born to Run too. And actually, initially, I was not going to have a whole lot of narrative. My goal was to get this right to the point, like, this is like news you can use. Like this is going to be a how to manual. And then the stories began to creep in. You know, I meet karma, a transgender runner and hear about her journey as a person who had been told over and over again by doctors, man, your knees are shot. You have osteoarthritis. You cannot run. Uh, And then the unbelievably courageous transformation that she went through both as a runner and as a human you know, you, you can't sit on material like that. You can't not tell that story. <laughs> so 
the stories began to creep in. And then as they, they crept in, what I kept finding was, as I'm telling the stories, something that Caballo had told me would always resonate, you know, in, in, in like Karma's story or, or Zach's story or Jenna's story. And also, as we were trying to summarize whatever the training advice was, something Caballo said always like rang true. Like, you know, first focus on easy because if that's all you get, that ain't so bad. And, uh, or, or when I was talking about the whole fun aspect, you know, we, we broke running down into these seven key fundamentals. And one of them is fun. Like running should be fun. If it's not, you're doing something wrong because then you're on a downward spiral of, of doubt and pain. But if every run feels good and uplifting, you're on an upward spiral of reinforcement. And I realized, oh, well, that's, that's what Kabai was trying to do with his running festival. He didn't want a bunch of strangers showing up. And then feeling anxious and nervous and, and then trying to beat each other and then leaving. He wanted people who like were friends, you know, who enjoyed each other, still trying to beat the piss out of each other, <laughs> but doing it from a sense of friendly camaraderie and not just like strangers uh, operating out of fear and, and um, you know, uh, in the unknown. And so it, bit by bit, I kept realizing, God damn, like uh, this dude was kind of a guru, like stuff that <laughs> I, I hadn't processed, the stray remarks, things about his life really informed the entire book. And in the end, I think the last chapter of Born and Run 2 uh, is, is hands down, like the best thing I've ever written, like the, the most thoroughly understood, dramatized, and I, I don't know, personal, quirky, weird. So I think it's like, okay, in some ways, my journey led me to writing that chapter because everything I've done along the way got me ready to do the thing, which I think is probably the best thing I've ever pulled off. It's great to hear you say in that, that final chapter, which I, I is so evocative and such a, a great, a great, a great piece of writing and a great tribute to him and, and, and a testament to your skill. And it's great to hear you celebrate it. Cause so often as writers, we just beat the shit out of ourselves. Nothing we ever do is is good enough. We can't reread our shit. You know, we do we're gonna look for the mistakes and to hear you say like, yeah, that that is some of the best writing I've ever done. It's a, uh, it's just it, it's pretty cool to hear and I imagine for other people to hear. You know, it has it taken you like, you know, a, a, a lifetime of writing to kind of sometimes give yourself credit? I think it's taken a lifetime of writing to stop second guessing mm -hmm. and just let it go. Let it and... rip, yeah. Let it rip and tell the story as you really lived it and felt it and stop worrying about what someone's going to think. And, you know, again, there's that, there's a kind of yin and yang thing there. Well, it's because you're worrying what, about what people think that you're trying your best to tell the story. So there is that reader pressure, but at the same time, like use your own language, uh, show the bruises, um, you know, it's, it's the thing in all, everything you do in life, it's a combination of doubt and confidence and, and finding that balance. You know, I, I play, I play pickup basketball and most of the time I'm like second guessing, like, ah, oh, man, you went left, you should have gone right, you know, tighten up your D, blah, blah, blah. And then every once in a while, you just don't give a shit and you play better than ever. You play <laughs> better than ever. You're hitting shots you never hit before because you're, you're loose and you're relaxed. And so it's finding that balance. And, you know, so even, even as I said that uh, I was able to do it and be really happy with that chapter, because I feel like I knew what I was talking about. I was not concerned about offending anybody, pissing anybody off. I, I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew what the chemical components were that made that thing work. I just know that in that moment, like, all right, I got this. Um, this, this is, this is good. And, and I think the other two, Brendan is about this thing we keep wrestling with, you know, finding your voice. Uh, yeah. I, I felt like I was telling that story exactly the way I would have told it to anybody, anytime. You know, if you and I were on a, a hike somewhere and you say, Hey man, tell me about how Caballo died. I would have, I think I probably would have told it exactly the way I told it to you. The fact that even like it opens up with Lewis Escobar, you know, driving down the highway, you know, you know, California 101, like driving his wife's SUV with his knees while he's sending out text messages. He can be pretty pissed, you know, <laughs> I'm talk talking about him texting and driving. Hey, man, that's the way it happened. And that's what gave it life. So, uh, yeah, um, you just let it fly. But 
you get easier said than done. I'm not sure if from for the next thing I write if I'm going to have that same looseness. Kind of gets to the idea, and I hear Seth Godin talk about this with Miles Davis. Like if he if he kept just trying to churn out kind of blue, you would never get bitches brew, or you'd never get other other things. And it's like, you know, you'll you'll just keep pushing your envelope, and maybe certain things will the landing will stick and, or maybe sometimes you may, maybe it'll never feel quite as good as that final chapter again, but it doesn't mean you, it doesn't mean you stop and it doesn't mean you keep striving. It's just, you just, it, to what we were saying earlier, you just kind of let it go and, and let it rip and see, see where the sort of the muse takes you after you've done your, your research and your reporting and you just kind of, you're like, you know what, let's just, let's just go. Let's just run with it. You know, it's funny though, cause I'm in a situation right now, where I'm working on something and I got a story to tell. And even now, like, oh boy, you're like, you know, <laughs> I don't know about this one. It's about this guy that I met body surfing who we call murder John. And, uh, <laughs> like, oh man, you know, this is a, uh, for a reason. I mean, the guy did two life terms, uh, and got out of jail and clemency and all right. I'm like, oh man, I mean, his kids are going to read this. I'm going to be interviewed about it. It's already like, I'm not quite sure how to, how to approach this. And so even as I'm preaching looseness, I'm already starting to <laughs> tighten, tighten up. up a little bit. <laughs> tighten up. Nice. And I got I to gotta talk to you about your the Born to Run shoes that you partnered up with Zero. You, Eric, and Zero. Like I saw the little trailer, the little featurette. Uh, online that you posted to Twitter, and I I looked at that. I'm like, oh my god! Like, uh, as long as supplies last, I got to get my hand on a pair of those because I I love the zero feel and I love the ethos behind what you were able to create with with Eric and and the gang at Zero. So just talk a little bit about how that came about. You know, it's funny. It came out of pure skepticism, and it's funny. I it was also. I was interviewed uh, at local uh, TV news in Denver um, for the shoe rollout. And I was rewatching like, man, the, the tone I have is so like skeptical. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, however, I like, boy, I just, I just couldn't let it go. There's like something like the South Philly. Uh, you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes that I just can't get rid of. And even in, in, as I'm trying to say something very positive and warm and glowing at the same time, there's a, there's an air of like, oh, we'll see. I don't, we'll see how this turns out about me. But what was cool about it, I think, was it's kind of an interesting place we're in now, Brendan, where I'm not sure if the old rules we had for journalism have changed or maybe they shouldn't have been there in, in the first place. But, you know, when I wrote Born to Run, there was a lot of interest in – I got a lot of offers from shoe companies, lots of different products wanted me – to, to partner with them and come up with stuff. Even like the, the, uh, the creators of Chia Pets, like the Chia Pet Company, because, you know, when, when Born to Run came out, suddenly there was this huge interest in Chia as, as a food. And so Chia Pets reach out to me and say, hey, let's, let's do a food product and let's partner up and do a food product. Because again, you couldn't, Chia seeds were not really available in the United States. Like you couldn't go to your Whole Foods and come home with a bag of them. And I was like, dude, absolutely not. Hmm. You know, I'm not collaborating with anybody that violates any journalistic ethics. I'm not partnering with anybody. A lot of shoe companies want to do a shoe and it was a flat no. So I look back on that and I guess it was the right approach. But at the same time, I'm like, I don't know. Sometimes as, as journalists, we, we I, I don't know. I, I don't know where I sort of come down on this, which is that you – the reason I'm sort of wrestling with this question is now we're in this whole kind of, you know, journalistic both sides and, you know, object, you know, object, objective reporting, but why not? And if you, if you look at a lot of magazines, it's actually hard to find the byline of the person who wrote it. Like the byline is often like buried. They don't want this story to be identified with a human person. Mm. They want it to just be a, a statement of fact handed down from above. And so, in Born and Run, I was pretty adamant, like, you know what? I'm just going to stay away from any endorsements of any kind of shoes. I'm not going to tell people what I wear. If you see me wearing them, I'll talk about it, but I'm not going to endorse anything. I look back on it like, was that stupid all along? Why, why not? Why not say, hey, these are the shoes that I really like and that really work? So again, 15 years later, for Born and Run too, I thought, man, I just can't be coy anymore. It's ridiculous. I've been getting, I get more questions about footwear 
by far by a by an exponential multiple than anything else. Yeah, I imagine. So why not just answer yeah. the question? And so what's interesting is important to run too. We actually recommend a different shoe. We tell people, hey, you know, get the uh, Ultra Escalante Racer. Like that's the transitional shoe you want. Born uh, a zero shoe might just be too extreme for most people to transition to. I don't necessarily agree. I, I kind of would recommend a zero shoe, but Eric, who knows more than me, says uh, that, that's a mistake. But then when it came time to say, hey, what do we actually wear ourselves? I thought, you know, let's just go for it. Let's just tell people exactly what we wear. And so then we had to make a choice. So we talked to Zero and said, man, we love your shoes. Um, do you guys want to partner up? And they said, sure. So I'm really happy that the Born to Run shoes that came from Zero. And what I also like is that they're kind of scrappy outsiders who kind of exist against all odds, taking on the shoe giants and still persist in creating the shoes that they want. Yeah, it really speaks to the uh, the spirit of I think like unsanctioned running, getting away from the 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 corporate behemoths, the corporate sponsored mega races, and you just kind of you know lace these things up, hit a trail, and start a race. Like I'm doing an unsanctioned marathon in in uh, August that I set up, and it's probably just going to be me. Uh, there's a one way. Uh, McKenzie River Trail that's 26 miles long along the McKenzie River and uh, just east of Eugene here in Oregon. And come August 5th, you know, I'm st- setting out early in the morning, just a rogue marathon. Whoever wants to come can come. The winner will get a, a growler and a handshake. And I'm just going to be out there knocking it around. No applause, no swag bags, no junk, no T-shirts, just a rip-roaring, unsanctioned marathon. And it's like the you know kind of it's kind of like the ethos of born to run and the copper canyon ultra and, and everything that you've stood for for the last 15 years <laughs> oh dude i'm already like kind of mentally scanning my calendar huh can i be in shape and in oregon by august 5th have you publicized this at all have you put it like online or anything uh not yet it's actually it's going to go out with my newsletter tomorrow for anyone who might happen to be in eugene and uh i just started like a just a beginner marathon training program i just wrapped up two weeks it's like a 16 week beginner thing and um i'm hoping to be in shape and healthy by then but yeah this is kind of like the first if you want to call this an announcement an announcement and uh who knows right on (laughs) so i'm I'm super intrigued and there's a quote i can't recall if i ever managed to work it into any of my books or not but it was a quote from somebody who was part of like a running club somewhere in Virginia. And they said the best races begin with someone dragging their toe in the dirt. And that's your starting line. Mm. And I, I can't remember. It's always a quote. I always wanted to use that. I'm not sure, never sure if I ever was able to stitch it in, but it's always stuck in my mind. Like, you know what? Just a bunch of your buddies. Someone drags a toe in the dirt. All right, here's a start. Let's go. Dude, I think it sounds terrific. You know, there's a race, the 26 point true in boston created by a terrific group called pioneers pioneers is a running club basically um by and for people of color in dorchester roxbury uh more of the uh, urban parts of boston and you know 26 point true people say you know what they they talk about the boston marathon but the boston marathon ain't in boston most of it's out in the suburbs you know it's in hopkinton newton it's not really in boston uh, there should be a marathon that really celebrates the diversity and the real character of Boston. So they created the 26 point true and it runs through 13 different neighborhoods in, in Boston. And at this point, I think this is like the third year this year. And it is a full on rogue, unsanctioned grassroots aid stations or somebody with a card table with cups of Kool-Aid outside their grandmother's house, that kind of a run. And I tell you, dude, you should check it out online because I defy you to find a photo of anybody in that race that isn't smiling somewhere. Like 26 miles is hard. Yeah. You know, it's not a party. And yet there's such a sense of joyfulness. So, man, that's, that's what you got looking forward to. You know, you're looking forward to August 5th. That's it. Yeah, that's going to be a Saturday. It'll be, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I have to kind of scout out the trail, kind of section hike it, make sure everything is open. I don't see why it won't be. But the fact that it's from beginning to end is basically a marathon length, not a ton of elevation change. You know, it's a little craggy and rooty in some places, but some great waterfalls. The McKenzie River is the cleanest water 
maybe in North America. And it's just going to be a, a rip roar and good time. And if I'm by myself, fine. Uh, but if I'm if I have a few other people with me, you know, that's what that's what it's all about. You can tell people this is their rare opportunity to become a streaker. So there's not many <laughs> well, it's different sense of streaker. So there are certain people who have run every race. There's a guy named uh, Bill Smith in Lancaster. There's a, a red rose um, half marathon and he's run it every year since it began in like the 1980s. So he's got, you know, 40 years of running this thing, but you know, it's pretty rare to be on the scene when a race begins. And you don't know if that race is going to last for five years or it could be going forever. You know, the New York city marathon was a couple of Jabonis just doing laps around central park. They didn't know that someday people would be fighting for entry bibs. So tell people, Hey, you want to be a streaker? You can run, the McKenzie River Rogue Marathon and be every single one, but you got to be here this year. Oh man, that's awesome! I'm like I've been excited about it anyway, just for my own, just for my own satisfaction. But it just, yeah, I'm like all the more excited to try to see it through. I just hope I can stay, uh, stay healthy for it. Yeah. Sure, man. And uh, yeah, Christopher, like uh, uh, as I like to bring these conversations down for a landing, I, I ask a guest for a recommendation of some kind and, uh, you know, some, anything you're excited about. And I just extend that to you for the listeners out there. You know, what might you recommend for them? So I, I learned a lesson when I was working on Born to Run 2 that, you know, I, I think as you're working on something, your instinct starts to take you to things that will help. You know, uh, when I was working on Born to Run, I obsessively watched the film Adaptation over and over again. Mm. Like I'd be out in my shed work until like two in the morning and I would come in before I go to sleep. I would just put on in the video of Adaptation and I look back on it and realize, oh, yeah, of course, like this is the parable of a guy who's struggling to write something. Like I didn't think it through at the time. It was just... It was a film I enjoyed and we had the video and I kept putting it in. I look back on it. Oh, so obvious, man. You were, you wanted to share the fellow feeling with uh, the Nicholas Cage guy, you know, Charles Kaufman character. And what I found myself doing in Born to Run 2 was for some reason drifting into kind of mystery suspense books. And uh, there's a woman named Sarah Gran, G-R-A-N, and a guy named Jonathan Moore, M-O-O-R-E. And I started reading their books. I kind of read through all their books, their entire canon while I was working on Born to Run 2. And then I realized why. It's like, you know, I'm writing a book that is ostensibly a training guide and there's no built-in suspense. There's no built-in story. And I think my instinct was directing me toward masters of suspense to just kind of absorb how these great writers create a sense of anticipation in everything that's going on in the books. Cause you know, it's not always racing from someone with a gun. Sometimes the characters are just having breakfast, but you're still propelled. So um, I think it's a great lesson for nonfiction writers, which is really like steep yourself in the masters of, of suspense, you know, Frederick Forsyth, um, Sarah Grant, Jonathan Moore, writers like that because they know they've got to keep you gripping on with your fingernails. And so and that, that would be the thing. So, and Sarah Grant, Sarah Grant, I, I don't really know much about her. She's not a really visible presence online to the point where I thought, I wonder if this is like an alias because the name seems kind of like made up. Um, but she has these mysteries, the Claire DeWitt mysteries, which I think are sensational, like some of the best writing of any kind that I've read, you know, in years. So that's, that would be my recommendation, man. Find Sarah Grant's stuff and, and soak it up. Fantastic. Well, Christopher, this is always great to talk shop with you and get, get your sense of uh, just the, the incredible like passion and energy you bring to um, bring to the bring to writing and bring to the running community and just every the life in general. So I just want to say, you know, thanks for coming back on the show and uh, and for sharing your insights. Hey, Brendan, man, now I'm thinking August five. So let's let's keep kicking that around. You know, dude, I know it'd be kind of fun, man. Get a bunch of like people you've interviewed, like say, hey, let's let's meet in real life. Let's just spend four hours on a trail together. You know, I, I'm wondering how many how many people off the top of your head you think would actually show up at people you've interviewed. Can you think of like three or four off the top of your head? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. I think it, I've done a number. I've interviewed a number of people who are in Oregon, so there that's kind of a low hanging fruit. Um, but uh, I think there are some others who might venture out this way and uh, and and do that. I think it'd be awesome to get together face to face. I just yesterday, um, Kelly Loudenberg, who episode three hundred nine fame, she wrote a wonderful piece for the Atavist uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago. And she happened to be passing through Eugene yesterday, and she emailed me. She's like, hey, I'm in Eugene for a few hours. Do you want to get coffee? I'm not prone to spontaneity. And I'm like, sure, yes, let's do it. And I, I rode my bike downtown, and we hung out for like 90 minutes, got coffee. She talk, talking about books she's writing on. I was talking about the book I was writing on. It was just great to hang out downtown, a beautiful day in Eugene. And uh, it was awesome. I was like, thank you so much for looking me up. That, was, that, that, was, that meant the world. Brendan, this could be new territory, a writer's hangout as as a marathon. You know, yeah. uh, hey, let's get together and talk shop. Because, you know, I, I don't really go to these things, but they have writer's conferences and you're sitting in a room somewhere and people are talking. Fuck that. Like, let's, let's all get out in the open air of Oregon. I, I think people will show up. They become like a destination weekend. You know, why not? Let's, let's travel to Eugene and run this marathon together and everyone's gonna be apprehensive well i'm not fast enough i'm not this it doesn't matter we're all just gonna chill exactly you know Uh, no one's racing yeah so it's all just chill for four or five hours on this trail i I, listen that would that would push me way closer to a plane ticket if i knew that the people that share the same anxieties and profession are all going to get together and run together like that would be cool not not runners but writers getting together oh my god what a what yeah. a trail full of neuroses that's going to be. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, Dude, I, I'm, I'm kind of on fire. The unsanctioned Mackenzie River Writers Hangout Marathon. <laughs> oh, AC and Evers, thanks for listening. Thanks for Christopher McDougall for coming to play ball and talk running and writing. Wouldn't you know that he was on a few weeks ago and we had a full on conversation. And my recording software did not record it. And you know what? He was nice enough to come back again, and we talked again. Like, who does that? McDougal, obviously. If some of you writers want to run, maybe come out to Eugene. You might even get McDougal to leave Hawaii and hit the trails here. Yeah, that's right. Hawaii. BrendanAmero.com. Hey, hey, that's where you get the show notes. And consider maybe signing up for the Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter. Book recommendations, a short essay, writing inspiration, and a series of links that literally go up to 11. First of the month, no spam, can't beat it. The Chronicles of Lachlan, the Loch Ness Monster. He's been back in our care for nearly a week. It's been going better than we thought. Everyone is in the house, uh, but everyone is uh, on the depression spectrum, that's for sure. All five of us. We've been counseled to keep Hank and Kevin separate from Lachlan until we get into reactivity training, which will, our consult is Wednesday, May 17th. So we've, yeah, Uh, Hank and Kev are pretty sad. We're imparting some boundaries with them, specifically Hank. No furniture privileges for Hank. Kev's okay. She can, she can do it. Um, He's, uh, Hank's adjusting okay to it. He's starting to just get the drill. He's like, oh yeah, I've got these comfy beds on the floor. I'm just going there. Kevin started limping yesterday, so that's awesome. Yeah, she just tends to tweak muscles sometimes or cut her stuff. She's just like, anyway. Uh, we have to be in different rooms at all the time, like sleep in different rooms. Uh, let the dogs sniff under the doors and when they're just being calm like that, like treating the shit out of them, rewarding that calm behavior. They're all walking separately. Uh, fortunately, I'm training for running, so I can bring Lachlan along for those. Just burn them out. Melanie's ankle's broken, so it's just I get up at 5. I do a quick little thing in the gym. Then I take Lachlan for a three-mile walk, come back, bring him into a back room with her, close the door, grab the other dogs, take them for about a three-mile walk, then... Then call yeah, Melanie and I are constantly on the phone talking to each other, just within the house or texting. Be like, okay, come coming in. All right, other two are in the living room. Okay, I can let Lachlan out. Uh, so yeah, that that's been the choreography. Very modular, texting nonstop. You know, 
come here, I need water. Can you make lunch? And since Melanie, like I said, broke her ankle, she lost all, like almost all of her mobility and freedom. Uh, the other dogs are sequestered in living room when, or when I'm alone with Lachlan, which is two days a week. And that that's tough, let me tell you. Uh, Melanie can usually take Lachlan in her office when she's working from home three, the three days a week, and I can hang with the other two, and they can roam around. The dogs largely don't care don't care that you know that Lachlan's around. They're almost desensitized to it, which is pretty great. You know, sometimes they see each other through baby gate. Um, no hackles on Hank because I think he's the main perpetrator, to be honest. Uh, no excessive barking uh, in the house, at least, which is nice. Uh, Lachlan does growl and bark at dogs and people out on runs in public and on walks. I'd like to think a trainer can help with that. Uh, see, I don't know. There's like mixed messages. Like when they're reacting to people or other dogs, I, I was of the thing like there were, you don't want to treat them when they're, if they're even receptive to food because you're like, oh, I'm rewarding aggressive behavior or something. But then I saw something else that's just like, oh, you want to treat them because you want them to realize that it's not like a bad situation. I don't know. I'm not a professional. I will find out next week. So once we get that sorted out, then we can work on separation anxiety. And that's all kinds of bad. Let me tell you, Kevin had it bad. Lachlan's got it good, too. He's got the bug. He's got the separation bug. Next few months are going to suck ass. They already do suck ass, and it's been five days. But Lachlan's showing signs of promise in some ways. His barking isn't nearly as bad as it was when we first had him. He's got a better understanding of boundaries, which is good. He's more or less uninterested in the other two, which is kind of good, I think. And he's better on the leash somehow. I don't know. Maybe that's because I'm walking him by himself. Anyway, the hope is that he's not too far gone where he can still learn manners and skills and that his quality of life can improve and the quality of life of, well, everybody else doesn't suffer dramatically. I'd like to think that they can all be integrated within a few weeks. Uh, most of the professionals we've spoken with don't want us to get our hopes up too much. You can tell just from looking at them and the tone in their voice that they're still very much thinking that the scenario where... He might be deemed, like, unfit, let's say. I'm not going to go there. I won't belabor the point, but I'll use the space in the parting shot to keep you posted on the journey of this guy. I won't tell you how many thousands of dollars it'll cost in training, but you can't take money with you, and we don't have kids, and what is money anyway? And capitalism, man. Down with capitalism, man. Stay wild, CNFers. And if you can do, interview CNF.